Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today I wanted to answer a question that I was asked a while ago, and that is how to put emotion into music when you're playing. And I've been thinking about this question ever since I received it, but I haven't received any like sort of ideas that I felt like would be sort of like universal or one size fits all. I feel like the answer to this question would be as numerous as there are musicians. I mean, everyone probably has their own unique ways of how they emote through music. But I didn't want to not do a video just because I didn't have like the one true answer. So what I wanted to do today is just share with you what I've learned over the years and you can agree or you could disagree, but this is just mainly a video meant to get your brain working and thinking of ideas. So let's get started. Sometimes when I'm reading a really good book, I'm like, wow, that was really cool and really subtle. And I'm going to try to write something like that. And then I try writing something like that and it comes out super basic and elementary and obvious. And then I get exasperated and just go back to reading. I use that as an example because you can have really good taste and you can have a really good ear and you can hear these masters weave their emotions in like very skillfully into their performances. But then when you try, you kind of just like fall flat and you sound like an elephant or something else that's not very subtle and graceful. It's really one thing to hear it, it's another thing to actually do it. And I know this might start coming off sounding like I'm saying, give up, there's no point, you're not gonna be able to do it. But I promise that's not what I'm saying. I just wanna get across that being able to emote through music is a skill that can take a long time to develop just like anything else we practice. So with that said, my first real suggestion of this video is to not be subtle because masters of musical emotion can be subtle, they're practiced, they know how to do things delicately. But when a beginner or an intermediate student, a lot of the times if we try to be subtle, it just ends up sounding like nothing's happening, nothing changed. So first, before you get to subtle, you have to master the extremes, like really work on those fortes, work on those like light pianos and go from there. Okay, so let's use drama class as an example. So compare a memory, I don't know if you ever took drama class because I don't know you personally, but if you did, I want you to compare that memory with say like a really good movie you've watched. What is the difference in acting between drama or theater or acting in a movie. So in drama and theater, movements and expressions need to be exaggerated because the audience is really far away. Without exaggerating, the people in the audience would just kind of see the actors and they kind of look like robots, right? So in a movie, the opposite things happen. Since cameras are zooming up like extremely close on actors' faces, they catch every little microscopic detail. So movies, movie actors can be and have to be extremely subtle in how they convey emotions. Otherwise, they're just going to look like super silly on screen. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I feel like beginner and intermediate students are generally too timid when it comes to expressing big emotions. I feel like in order to master the subtle, you need to first master the dramatic. A lot of the times what I find happens is you might think you're being really dramatic on the piano and like think to yourself, wow, that was quite the forte I just did. But then the listener like doesn't even notice anything at all. It would be like going up on stage and performing in front of people and just gesturing and talking in like a conversational way. They're not going to be able to hear your voice. And if you're just like doing normal gestures, in like instead of big wild gestures, no one's gonna know what's going on with your character. So I always say you wanna learn how to exaggerate first. And then once you've kind of mastered the exaggeration, that's when you can train yourself to scale back. But you you can't just go like straight to subtle. You usually have to like learn how to do things very obviously first. I don't know if this is just me, but since I do a lot of singing, I actually find that emotional expression through singing is actually quite a bit easier than through the piano. And even if you don't sing much, I still want you to listen to this next point because I think it's important. So phrasing, it is that thing where you have slurs sectioning the song off into different pieces. So these big swoopy lines here, these, these slurs. For a really, really quick review, phrasing simply means that if you were singing this at the end of the phrase, so right here, you would take a breath. On the piano, since you know you're you don't obviously need to like literally breathe in that part, you convey that sound with a slight lift off from the keys to create a break in the sound. But so often within a phrase, we play notes in a flat line, all the same volume with no movement, kind of like this. So I'm just gonna play that same um, phrase from a song called Melody by Schubert. Sorry, Schumann. So, I mean, I played all the notes, right? But you heard how it was kind of just like everything was just monotonous and, and the same. But it's 
it's really easy to end up doing that on the piano because we don't necessarily think about it. It's not as obvious as it is when you're singing. If you try singing a phrase with every single note the same volume, you sound like a robot. And most of us, even the non-musical among us, can recognize that. I mean, no one, no one sings like that. Like, even bad singers don't sing like that. So, for an example, on the piano, something that has a little bit more movement and isn't just played on a flat plane, I would do something like this. So every note was a little bit different. I didn't do anything too, too crazy, but it wasn't just like everything the same like a robot. So whether or not you've got the voice of an angel, I want you to think about how easy it is compared to, you know, playing piano, how easy it is to emote with your voice. I mean, I'm not even talking about people who are like, I'm not talented, but secretly they're actually like super talented. I'm talking about like years of living in apartment buildings and overhearing people belting out Celine Dion in the shower with like all their passion, like so many times. So all of us have like, you know, at one point or other, probably like, belted something out with like raw motion. So that's the that's the kind of thing that you want to trigger when you get to the piano. And I think how you do that is by looking at phrasing. Look at a phrase and think, okay, well, how would I sing this? And then play it the way you would sing it. And I think that in and of itself would go a long way to being able to play with emotion instead of just kind of playing robotically. When I was planning this video, I wanted to include something about technical skills and tech technical mastery because it was kind of making sense to me that the better you get at your instrument, the more control you have and the wider reach you'll have on, I don't know, being able to like control the expression of your emotions and stuff like that. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it wasn't true because there's so many bands and artists out there that people love that are just not very good. They don't have like, uh, like technical skill the way other, other people do, but they have something else. They have that ability to convey like passion and emotion through their music. And that makes up for their shortcomings. And it works the other way too, because there are artists who are extremely, extremely technically good but their music or their art or whatever it is just kind of like has, has an emptiness because they don't know how to convey that emotion with their art. So I think in truth, you can play with emotion right from day one. You can play Mary Had a Little Lamb with emotion just as well as you can play Moonlight Sonata with emotion. I don't think it's something that you have to like wait for to, to start learning. I don't think it's like after you hit a certain technical pinnacle, then you can start learning it. And I feel like, okay, so the rest of this video is gonna, it's gonna get a little abstract for a bit because I want to talk about what art is. So near the end of the video, I'm going to list some practical suggestions I think that you can do aside from just the things we've already talked about, like dynamics and stuff to, um, I don't know, to like work some emotion into it. But first I want to talk to you about a very important question. We got to like get to the heart of this first. What is art? To me, art is storytelling. And it's not storytelling in the sense that it has to have like a be beginning and middle and climax and end and denouement and all that stuff, though it can if you want it to. But boiled down to its essence, I think art is communication just from one person to another. So what is a painter communicating to you with her painting? What's an author telling you with his book? What's a performer telling you about her character? And so on. So because art is this two-way communication, we can get Get really fixated on what we want the other person to think or feel or whatever. So say we're a writer and you know, you're thinking like, okay, well I have this sociopathic character. How can I make the reader realize this character is a sociopath? Well, maybe I'll just like write her doing something that lacks empathy. Or if we're a musician, um, we might think something like, man, this is a really sad piece. I wonder like, how I can play this in a way that'll make someone like really sad, someone else like really, I don't know, cry. But I think this is the wrong approach and here's why. So people don't like being told what to do, even if it's like in a subtle, unconscious way. So if you're thinking to yourself, I want to affect you, like this person who I'm communicating to with my art, I think it kind of falls flat. You kind of have to think about it the other way. Like instead of trying to make someone else cry, how could you make yourself cry? Make it, it kind of, it sounds selfish to say that, but you really have to affect yourself and play it in such a way that would make you cry. And people will respond to that instead. They don't respond to being told how to feel or think or do. But if you yourself are really sad when you're playing the song, they'll be able to feel that from you because people are 
generally, unless you're a sociopath, like em empathetic. So whatever emotion you're trying to convey, whether it's just like contentment and peacefulness with Mary Had a Little Lamb, or it's like the romantic passion of Liszt's Liebestrom, the one who has to experience that feeling is you. And when you're experiencing an emotional story while playing, your listeners are going to pick up on that and then they're going to experience that feeling kind of by association. All right, so what is your song about that you're playing? If it's a piano song, there's a really good chance that there's no words, so that's not gonna help. But maybe the title's gonna give you some clues or maybe it won't. So you're gonna have to create some sort of story for that song. There are a million ways to do this. I'm just gonna give you a few ideas off the top of my head, but this is by no means an exhaustive list and you can come up with your own creative solutions for you know how to, how to experience a feeling for what you're playing. So first of all, you can get to know the actual story of the song via research. So was who is the composer? What were they going through when they wrote that song? What was their life like? And what were the circumstances of their life? And if you can really like get inside that real person's head, then you can kind of bring some of that into your performance. Another thing you can do is invent a story. So say you have a like kind of boring title of your piece and it's called Minuet and C. Maybe you can conjure up feelings of joy and enthusiasm by say envisioning two characters dancing at an old fashioned ball. And maybe there's like some hijinks or something. So the third idea, you can invent lyrics. I know this one, Kind of sounds a little crazy, but I used to do it all the time back in the day. And I find this particularly effective with lighthearted and jovial songs because you can just come up with funny lyrics that make you want to laugh. And then if you want to laugh while you're playing, you're going to play in sort of that laughing manner and convey that happy emotion to other people. Connect music to artwork. So say you're playing a dramatic Beethoven sonata like Moonlight Sonata. If you find a piece of art from Beethoven's era that you find represents the sound of your piece and play with that painting in mind and maybe even like literally in front of you, um, it'll, it'll help you visualize what you're trying to convey through sound. Some of us are just more visual people. So for some people, it's really, really helpful to have like a very specific image. And then it's almost like you're painting, but with the, piano. One thing I really like to do and I do this often is, and we kind of talked about this, sing the melody. And in particular, I want you to think about it like this. How would you sing the melody of your song if you were auditioning for something like American Idol or The Voice? Something to consider. So another thing you can do, imagine the song you're playing as a background track to a scene in a movie what's happening in this movie and in this scene what are the actors doing and how is your piece amplifying the mood again it's another way to get like really specific mental images in your head and sometimes it's it's useful for people to think in terms of movies and scenes if you were to attach the song you're learning to one of your life memories which memory would it be and you can re-experience that memory with the song as your background track for it so that's it's kind of a, i like doing this because it's like a fun way to connect to your past a little bit and since it's something you've like actually actually literally lived yourself it's a lot easier to like put yourself back in that position so you, you don't have to like put yourself in another person's shoes you're just putting yourself in your own shoes so hopefully that gave you some ideas to implement in your own practice got the wheels turning at least and you don't have to agree with everything i said i know i feel like really passionately about the things that i say because it's my point of view but if you have other thoughts about like how to play emotionally or you think something i said is really wrong or you have your own input or whatever just leave it in the comments below because i was like reading what you have to say and i know other people like reading what you have to say too. Thanks again for watching this video. And if you missed it in the last video, I just want to like make a quick mention of this. We started the hashtag project, hashtag 30 days of piano, where the goal is for us like as a group to practice piano every day for 30 days. And we're just like posting little video videos and snippets and stuff like that of our practice. I'm over there and there's a few of us over there doing things. So if you need like a little bit of a summer motivation boost, come hop on over to Twitter and play the 30 days of piano game with us. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you next time, guys. I may or may not have just been like belting out what is love. Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs>